Okay, so um, today I would like to talk about 3D surface modeling. And first, uh, I would like to take you back to uh, a time long ago where we could get results without deep nets. And uh, so what this is, this is a baseball ball that's being thrown against something that looks like a bat very hard. And uh, from this video sequence, what we can do, or what we could do, is uh, get the images, deform a model of the ball. The ball initially is a sphere, so when it hits the bat, it becomes this weird shape. From this, we can infer the 3D shape, and we can do uh, the reconstruction. And why do we do, do we do that, you may ask, is because we were collaborating with mechanical engineers in uh, Washington State University, not far from you, uh, who are interested in uh, building simulation tools. And actually, it's surprisingly hard, in all sense of the term, to model uh, a baseball and its interaction with a bat. So the point of this was to give to the mechanical engineer the ground truth. So we get the ground truth from vision. Beautiful. And then their task was to adjust their uh, simulation algorithms to, uh, to produce what really happened. And then we can have some games. So that was immersive uh, five years ago or six years ago. So we have uh, an iPad that looks at the children's book and uh, it, it watches the, the pages being deformed and the elephant reacts to that and there are no political implications in this. Uh, okay, so these are front examples and what they have in common is that they rely on 3D meshes. So trying to do 3D meshes, which it's a really good representation, it's pervasive and there are lots of things for which you need them. So for example, uh, high poly rendering. Yes, you can do rendering using other representations like point clouds and surfaces, etc. But to the best of my knowledge, if you want really high quality, you need a mesh. And that's true for the others that are below. But they have a key limitation is that the topology is fixed and they're not particularly deep net friendly. You can be stuck in a deep net architecture, but you have to do some contortions. Um, so an alternative that's emerged, and actually, that's actually old, the idea of representing surfaces as implicit surfaces, by which I mean you have a cube of uh, data, you have a field, and the surface is a zero crossing of that field. And this is actually, it's, I'm aware of it since the 1990s with Osho and Setian. It's probably even older than that. Uh, and until recently, it was perceived as being cool, but impractical, because you had to represent this field as a cube. And getting to a high resolution this way was hard. You needed a gigantic cube that would eat all the memory of your computer. Not good. Until what I'm going to describe now. So for those of you who are not familiar with this kind of representations, the typical one is something called a sine distance function or field, SDF. So it is a function F from R cubed to R, where F is a sine distance to the function, meaning it's positive out, it's, it's a distance to the surface, it's positive outside the object, it's negative inside, and the surface itself is where the function is zero. So one great strength of this is the topology, by changing the field, you can change not only the shape, but also the topology, which is much harder to do with an explicit representation. Uh, and that's been known for a while, but as I said, it was perceived to be not very practical because of this memory storage problem. Until a few years ago, some bright people came up with the idea that you don't need to represent the cube. You can use a deep net to do that, to represent it implicitly. And what you have is a deep net that takes as input 
uh, x, x here is a points in 3D space, and a code. A code, you can think of it as a, vec a latent vector that parametrizes a surface. You feed this into the network, and you get s, the sine distance, equals f of theta, the result of the network, as a function of x, where you are in space, and c, uh, the value of the code that defines the shape of the surface. And that gives you surfaces that can deform and change a topology by changing c. So that's very nice, and there's been a ton of literature about this in the last few years, but there's one bottleneck that remains, is that if you happen to need an explicit representation, for example, to do high quality rendering, or as I'll show in a moment, to do computer flow dynamics, you need to get, to get from the implicit to the explicit, you need to do marching cubes, or something like it. And that's inherently non-differentiable. So in our deep world, this is a bit of a problem because it makes it harder to integrate in a pipeline. So in fact, and that's our contribution, we've shown that it's not a problem. It's not a problem because you get the vertices using marching cubes, and then you can differentiate with respect to C even though marching cube itself is not differentiable. So, uh, uh, and if you want the actual, I mean, we, there's even a proof of that that you can find in the paper if you are interested. So that means that we can start with a, vector, a latent vector C that represents, uh, this is the UC Davis cow for some reason, and we can uh, transform that cow that is of genus zero, there are no holes, into a rubber duck that is of genus one, one hole, and it's all continuous, and we have a mesh representation at every step of the way. So for example, we can compute a chamfer distance if we want. We can compute, I mean, I'm not sure the aerodynamic qualities of that thing are, but we can compute them if you're interested. So what is this good for? So first, what I kind of think as a bit of a toy application, but one that's important to get your paper accepted in CVPR, so that makes it important, uh, is a single view reconstruction. Why do I say that it's a bit of a toy application? Because as Mark knows, for example, you can do multi-view, it works great, so why would you do that? But okay, so we, there is no arguing with a CVPR reviewer. So. Uh, single view, um, you have an image, you compute, you train a network to produce the C vector, the, the latent vector that describes the chair. That gives you an initial chair, the one that's labeled C0 on my slide, which is not great. It's roughly correct, but that's it. And then, because you have a differentiable representation, you can optimize with respect to C0 or to C, so that the projection becomes closer and closer to the real thing. And in the end, we get uh, C at time T, so at the end, that creates a chair that projects at the right place, and to show you that it projects at the right place, you can see on the right side, it's the same chair seen from a different viewpoint, and you see it's about right, even though, I mean, this is kind of a difficult example because it has this very thin legs. And you can also uh, do editable models from 3D sketches. So here is the idea. This is geared towards artists who would, or people working who are artsy but work for an engineering firm. And you ask them to design a chair or a car. So to them, it's fairly natural to sketch it, which you see on the left. And the system will produce uh, a result, so a, a car or a chair that best fits the drawing. And then we have an iPad demonstration that says, okay, well, I kind of don't like that chair. In one case, I want the armrest to be lower, and the other ca case, I want the, um, the back wheel to be further in front. I want the car to be, to be shorter for some reason. So I sketch that on my iPad. That's an additional constraint on the reconstruction. 
and it will update the model to produce the thing on the right. And something that's interesting, I think, about the chair is you can notice, again, the chair initially had armrest, so it's genius two. By lowering the armrest, actually the armrest is completely gone. It's still a chair, but now it's a chair of genus zero. So it has changed its topology. And now and what I'm moving to is what is the real driving force behind this and also actually be behind the, the project we are doing with Ashish in the context of the, the GRC, uh, which is what you just saw in this video was you start with a sphere. That sphere is incompressible and we are going to build a shell around it to minimize aerodynamic drag. So the, the, the wind is, it's moving toward the right of the screen to the wind that's going to the left. So here you have, we are essentially changing the parameters of the surface, the C vector I mentioned in the previous slide, to minimize the drag. And we get this pointy shaped thing uh, with this uh, long tail at the back, which to me it's very reminiscent of uh, if you see a uh, bike, uh, cyclist, speed cyclist, they have these very long pointy helmets for exactly the same reason. They need to have something, a shell around something that's vaguely circular and that minimizes drag. And again, we built an interface on this. What uh, the idea here is you allow a designer to sketch a car and the system will produce a car that looks like it and has reasonable aerodynamics properties. And that actually, I mean, this, this is a real application. Like, as you can see, the, I put the little neural concept logo. We are trying to actually commercialize this. And um, because in, I mean, why do you buy a car? Do you buy a car because it goes fast? Because it holds to the road? Well, maybe, but if so, you're a minority. Uh, people buy cars that make their, uh, their neighbors jealous, all that look good. That's really the driving force. And to obtain that, the key is to design it so it looks good. And then, well, it's kind of nice to have it be aerodynamic as well, but the, the guy who does the designing typically is an artist. He's not an engineer, he doesn't know about CFD, so this is a tool that can help him in his design task. And this is actually a real application of this where um, uh, something we did in fact fairly early on where we had a collaboration with uh, colleagues in Annecy. Annecy is a town about 100 kilometers from here. Um, this may not look like it, but it's a bicycle. So it's actually the aero shell around the bicycle and you can guess you have the wheels at the bottom. Uh, and you have the two bikers, but they don't go together, it's one after the other. And uh, it's a reclining bike, so they are leaning, their feet are in front, their head is in the back. And they went to, um, to Nevada before, just before COVID. Uh, there's this very, very long straight road, so eight kilometers long, flat, straight. So they pedal like mad and they get clocked on the last 100 meters. And they did go pretty fast because they, they broke a couple of world records. So there is no electric assistance here. It's purely muscle power. Uh, and it's, uh, well, there are lots of things that you have to do right, but having low aerodynamic drag is one of them. Okay, and that brings me to uh, today. So uh, why am I here today is because we now have a project with Ashish in uh, Seattle to do, to extend this to something called dynamic soaring. So the idea of dynamic soaring is you have, you go to a place on earth and there are some such places where you're on the top of a mountain, below the ridge, there's no wind. Above the ridge, there's a lot of wind. And so if you have a glider, so an aircraft, but that does not have an engine, uh, it's going to go loops, as you see here. It's going upwind in the part of the air where there is no wind, and downwind 
in a part of the air where there's a lot of wind. And if you do this right, you're going to gain energy at every loop to the point where I think the world record I read yesterday is 882 kilometers an hour. No engine. It's pretty fast. And that actually uh, creates a few problems. Eventually, you eventually go so fast that the guy who's trying to remote control it is just too fast for him. It, it gets to get beyond what a human can do. So what do we do in this case? We make a robot. And that's what the, the project is about, is this, is this is the glider, and what the colors are a CFD simulation. Uh, the control will be robotic, courtesy of Ashish. And what our job is going to be in this project is to make it easy to control. And that's actually a pretty big departure from what's normally, normally what's often done is you design the plane, the glider, the car, or whatever, and then you call the roboticist and you tell him, okay, well, please control it. Here, the idea is to include the notion that it should be shaped in such a way that control is easy from the very start. And, okay, so the, the glider is fun and, uh, and we both like flying, but uh, this has many real world applications if the idea is to change things are designed. So here's an example. Of course, everybody is concerned about sustainable, so I have a windmill. And actually, this is surprisingly complex. First, these things are huge, enormous. And second, they're hard to design. Because among problems, you have to worry about the aerodynamics of the prop. And they are not the same as on a plane. You have all sorts of different problems on this huge things. And you have structural issues because, well, they have to be aerodynamic and light and strong. And finally, you have to be able to control them because if it turns too slow, it doesn't generate enough power. If it turns too fast, you break everything. And it's actually a very difficult control problem. And the way this is typically done is you do it in stages, and the different stages are not truly coordinated with each other. What our idea is, an extension, of course, of the glider would be to have this whole thing into integrated in some massive loss function that we could use to, uh, to design this. And of course, I mean, this is another example that you may have heard about recently as DeepMind uh, had a paper about controlling a nuclear fusion. So another, and this actually is some of the same ideas can be used in, a, in this very different context. Okay, so in conclusion, what I've shown is that we have an approach that allows you to compute explicit and implicit representation and in a sense, get the best of both worlds. That, in practice, we use deep signed functions that allow us to, uh, to have surfaces whose topology can change while preserving end-to-end -end differentiability. And this essentially, I think, will be a critical block into designing algorithms in many different fields, including so computer assisted design, but also, for example, medical imaging, where you want to model organs in the body and where these techniques are completely applicable. That's it. Thank you very much. Okay, do we have any questions? Anyone? Hi. Thanks for a nice talk. Uh, I was wondering, um, for the uh, drag coefficient uh, computation, for instance, would it mean that the CFD module has to be differential too, or? Like to compute the drag. So for, for the drag, uh, for instance, uh, um, the mesh was differentiable, but uh, the drag itself is probably like a very complicated function of the shape. You have to run some simulation, I guess, or something. Does the simulation, the CFD, has to be differentiable too, or is this? Yes, uh, yes okay. because I, I didn't describe that, but what we do is we train another deep net, so GCNN, so geodesic CNN, to take the, the mesh output and predict the output of the simulation, mm -hmm. emulate the simulator. And that actually, surprisingly, that worked remarkably well, because if you know about these things, uh, 
Navy Stokes. Yes, that's. They're very nasty, unpleasant people. They're hiding on the air. And you would think it doesn't work, but it actually works. Okay. Wow. So it works for fully Navier Stokes with turbulence and everything, or is there some point where. Okay, wow. Cool. Yeah. And so the key is um, to have, of course, as anything deep, is to get, have a good trading database. And that's why we've hired a lot now. We have one engineer who's. So simulation is a black art. Uh, and we have an engineer who's adept at this particular black art. Right. Thanks. Okay, any other questions? If not, let's thank Pascal.